Well, yesterday we stopped, we stopped here. We were speaking about uh, we were speaking about gays, and we 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 started by speaking a uh, brief recap. We started by speaking about multimodal interaction, and so as a way to have in a user interface, in an interactive system, uh, more than one uh, sensory channel or more than one mode of interaction to increase not only the richness and the bandwidth of the uh, interaction, but also to uh, apply some redundancy. So to provide the same content, the same information in different way, uh, in complementary way or uh, duplicate way, let's say, maybe by voice and by output on the screen and and also and this apply to input and also to output as well separately typically and we started to analyze a little bit the, the possibility that we can consider while creating a, a user interface or an interactive system by using this our senses and our capabilities uh, one at time and we start to speaking about vision very very briefly because the, the course is already about uh, vision mostly and we start to speak about gaze uh, and for, for gaze we need for tracking gaze our eyes on the screen let's say we need eye tracking and we need an eye tracker as an hardware so what is an eye tracker these are just a few examples of commercial commercially available eye tracker so you can go to the website of this producer and buy them uh, if you want they are quite expensive uh, less than in the past, but uh, they are still expensive as product. And what, what is on the tracker and what we are seeing in these slides? Well, we are seeing two families of a tracker. Let's say one dedicated to uh, understanding people, where people are looking, what people are doing on a screen or an environment. And this one on the right are instead uh, designed and created for people with disabilities uh, in particular. So they have some uh, dedicated software installed on it. But basically, uh, the, the tracker is a set of uh, cameras, infrared cameras here in this portion under a screen that could be a screen that is provided by the tracker itself or could be a screen you have a screen and you attach an eye tracker just this bar in the screen or you can also have an eye tracker in the form of these eyeglasses uh, where the goal here is not to understand what you are watching on a screen but be also but in this case you can wear these eyeglasses go around maybe doing grocery shoppings and the person that is connected to this eye tracker uh, will see uh, everything that you look at. So if you look at the brand or on something that you are buying, if you're looking, looking at the price, if you are seeing other people, all these non-privacy aware things that you can do in the real world. But not only again on, on screens, but also in a real environment. Obviously this is more for uh, eye tracking understanding where the user is looking at on a screen and basically this is the real eye tracker hardware and in, in the eyeglasses is basically this part this thing here and this part on the top of the um, of the eyeglasses uh, in, in this other example you still have a bar this one here or this one here into different size that is a set of infrared cameras to track, to identify and track the pupil of a person. And also here you have some additional software like this is a software for uh, augmentative and alternative communication, AAC. Uh, that basically it's, it's an alternative way of communicating for person that are nonverbal, again, nonverbal, mm, temporary or permanently, uh, it's the same, but essentially you cannot speak, you cannot verbalize what you want to do. And so with an eye tracker and also with this methodology, this uh, way of communicating that could also be on paper and you are in some way indicating 
uh, the, the item that you want to, to, to consider. So basically here with a tracker, you can say, you can look at these and say, hi, uh, then for instance, you can look at these and say like, and you can, I don't know, go in another screen and say uh, computers. So you select these with your eyes, you look at these and these are, this device say, will, will pronounce hi. Then you look at these and this device will pronounce like. Then you may probably uh, go in here, uh, all word list and have other squares like these that you can select with your eyes and the, the system will vocalize the, what you are selecting on the screen. And this is called alternative and augmentative communication because it's alternative and enabled to communicate with these pictures plus words for non-verbal user. And here you have another interface made in a similar way. Notice here big buttons uh, because again, the eye tracker, as I said yesterday, is typically less precise than a mouse. So you can, you should have bigger button on the screen. Yeah, you can also have smaller than this, but obviously if the button is bigger, it's easier to uh, focus, to fixate the button that you are mostly interested in. And how a tracker works essentially uh, is it compatible with glasses? What I trackers in general? Yes. Uh, let's say that for if you most of the time. Uh, I mean, I, I can use an a tracker without any problem with my glasses, for instance. Uh, but some people with maybe some lenses, or if the lens is if the lens is particularly uh, wide uh, may have some problem, but yeah, generally it's compatible to glasses. So uh, how it works? Uh, basically, the tracker is this bar. So th this producer sells all, all also the version with a screen, just a bar that you can plug on your computer via USB. And this bar is a set of cameras, project, a set of cameras and projector. So essentially what, what this does is uh, the, the eye tracker is projecting a pattern on your face uh, of infrared light. So that it is not a visible pattern, just a near infrared light on the eyes, especially on, on this area on, on the face. And the camera on the uh, bar takes high resolution images of your eyes and in particular on the pupil and try to uh, identify where the pupil is. The software that is running attached to this hardware on the computer has a series of uh, algorithms, uh, mainly stemming from images processing and machine learning that are used to determine the high position in the face, the pupil position, um, and translate the pupil position uh, with respect to the coordinates on the screen. And this software does typically more than this. It's able to track the movement of the pupil and it's also able to understand your fixation. So if you are looking at a specific point for a long time, so not only tracking the movement, but also taking counting, let's say how long you fix a specific point. So essentially is just a set is a set of camera that uh, and, and some infrared light that identify your eyes, your pupil and, and how you move the pupil and translate these in the screen coordinate on in the coordinate or in the space, like in the high glasses where the coordinates are the one on the glasses, obviously. But let's say in, in any screen it could be in the glasses or in a real screen, like a computer screen or also in a mobile phone. There are some mobile, some eye trackers uh, that could be attached to mobile phones and as a cameras, and uh, and, and, and use the same the same principle. Uh, actually, also the um, uh, face recognition camera that some smartphone has uh, uses a, a similar approach for a very different scope. They are not interested in determining the high position, fixation, and so on, but uh, they are using typically infrared camera and so on to perform the same uh, the same 
do the same operation, let's say, even if they are not focusing on the eyes. And what we are using a tracker for, we are using a tracker for, we can enable new way of interaction like this uh, AEC uh, that we bore that we have seen before with people with disabilities, but we can also use this for understanding how people relate with a user interface on a screen. And you have seen already heat map in the lecture about visual design. Here, it is another example of heat map on a mobile phone. Uh, so basically what this heat map is saying is saying that the user after navigating this website for a while, uh, looked mostly at the here with, when it's red here in this spot that is again red a little bit less here in this area and basically never looked at all these let's say white transparent areas so this 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 is useful uh, this could be useful for also understanding where well obviously where the user is looking at and where to place the important information that you want the user to look at first or to look at in general. So if you want to put to place an important information, probably you should in this page, probably this is an important information. So this is a good spot to place an important information. And don't probably put here, the, the information that is here, this get direction is not probably important as this user or this set of user haven't had a look at this. Also this more button was basically ignored according to, to this uh, eye tracker, uh, the, this heat map. And the same data that is used for generating an heat map could also be used for generating this scan path where they are the same uh, raw data behind where the difference is that in a heat map, you see where the user is looking mostly. So here in the red area, is where the, the user is looking mostly, and then in the yellow area a little bit less, and then uh, and then down of this road. Uh, here instead, you are not only interested in where the user is looking uh, at, but you are interested in also in how the user moves from one space, one point to the other. So here we don't know if, if the user moves from here to here and then here. Here we know that the user looked a lot here, this big circle. And then from here, it goes down to here and then stay a little bit and then here and they come back and stay a little bit and then here and then there. So you can see the, the, the path of, of, of fixation of how the eyes moved and where the eyes stopped. And so they stop surely on the logo of this page and then in this navigation, it look at this name here and this picture here a little bit and a specific point and with a specific, let's say, path going from here to here to there. And so you can also understand where the user is going, is looking at before and then after and then in a second moment and then in the end. So you can also recreate the, the scan path of the user. And this is for understanding uh, how people is looking at, uh, at the screen and maybe react if you want, if your software is able to, uh, to, to, the, to what the, the tracker use this information to generate something. You can react if the user is looking he here, you can do something, for instance, your application could do something. And if you, this instead is the Windows 10 eye control settings. So if you plug an eye tracker on a Windows 10, an hardware tracker on a Windows 10 uh, computer, uh, you have in the setting, in the control panel, these settings here that uh, are, you see a big button because they are controllable with an tracker when, uh, when it's active, but also with a mouse. Uh, and you see there are some options like uh, advanced mouse, uh, if you want to show uh, help pop-ups while you're using the tracker on Windows 10 and apply settings, the settings and, and so on. And also these activation methods. These activation methods provides you with three options. One is advanced settings if you want to, to have other option and two main option for choosing how to activate 
things on a screen, on a user interface, and on an application. And for activation, uh, what does it mean for activation is to click on item. Because uh, eye tracker uh, suffer, let's say, of the uh, Midas touch. Do, do you know or remember the, the story of King Midas, Mida? Yeah, the one that uh, everything is touches um, becomes gold. And the tracker in the user interface have the same, let's say, problem. Not that everything that the user is looking at becomes gold, but since you have a user interface in which there is the te some text and some button, and with different properties, you can click on these buttons while you cannot click on the text. Uh, but the eyes and the gaze is just movement on the screen. So if I'm looking here, uh, I'm reading and, and no action is, is attached to this. If I'm looking here or here or here or here or in any of these buttons here, there, we need a way to understand if you are just reading, dwell, switch, advanced setting, on, off, or if you are interested in clicking things. Because we don't have this problem with the mouse because a mouse move uh, on things and then when we want to click something, we just press the button. And we don't have this problem with touch screen because we just have a look uh, at the phone or a tablet and when we want to press something, we just press it uh, uh, separately uh, with, the, with our hands. With a tracker, we don't have this discrimination. We, everything could be potentially clickable and we, we need a way to say, okay, I'm just interested in reading, dwell, switch, advanced settings, or I'm interested in even pressing this button or this button or this button. So we understand, apply standard, let's say methodology for activation methods. So activation methods, it's how we inform the tracker and the application that is used to any tracker uh, to perform this click operation to avoid the mid Midas touch in which everything could be uh, clickable since we look at everything. Um, and Windows 10 presents two options that are quite popular. Uh, the first one is switch. Basically, uh, the switch activation methods say, you can look everywhere on the screen, also button and nothing happens. If you want to click a button, you have to look at the button and press something, press a button, press a key on the keyboard, press something that is outside the tracker. So if I want to press switch with the, the, the switch met activation method, uh, I need to look at switch, straight to switch, and also press something on the keyboard on outside, let's say the screen. And this combination of factors, the pressure of the button plus the fixation on a specific point uh, give the activation command and perform the action of selecting this button. The dwell method instead rely uh, only on um, eye tracking without external devices. So you don't need to press something. You can just use uh, the tracker for performing this operation and uses the concept of time. So if you want to, uh, with dwell mode, active, you want to uh, apply settings here, you just need to fixate this button for a certain amount of time that typically is uh, settable by the user. So let's say that this time is 10 seconds, 15 seconds, something like that. So if I want to apply setting, I have to fix this for 10 seconds. And what happened with the, the well is, is that when I uh, looking at this, uh, typically appears a uh, progress bar in some form, circular or linear, that say how time, uh, how much time is needed for completing the, the operation. So in this way, I can read everything. I can read or restore the folds. Uh, the important thing is that if I don't want to select this, I, I just need to move to another element, any other element before this time lasts. So if I if this this is ten seconds, I have less than ten seconds to read this. If I don't want to select this, if I want to select this, I can 
I need to look at it at this button everywhere in the space of this button for 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, this button is clicked. So this is obviously not entirely optimal uh, because it, it requires more time for uh, selecting an, an element since you need to add these 10 or 15 seconds every time. Uh, expert, let's say uh, eye tracker user uh, can uh, reduce this time uh, a lot, uh, also in two, three seconds if they want. And also it depends obviously on, on the, of the kind of user interface. If there is a user interface with a lot of buttons, uh, you maybe need a little bit, little bit more time with long text. If you just have yes or no, you can keep this time very, very short. But this is something that is either, this activation method is something that is peculiar for eye tracking based application. So when you use gaze for interacting with the computer, you have to keep in mind this, that you need a way to say, okay, this is the click and this is not, I'm just reading the text of a button or the text of a switch. Uh, while I instead I want to click the button, click the switch. And this close, let's say, the vision and gaze part. That uh, as we as we say, especially the vision, as we said yesterday, the vision is present in 99% or in the vast majority of user interfaces and interactive system. Gaze is not so popular, but it can be used as a mode of interaction. And now we, we know that the second most popular, most used um, sense is hearing. Uh, and we will speak about hearing, but before let's speak about small smell and taste that we know that uh, they don't play a, a big role in human computer interaction in a user interface, you typically don't smell uh, a user interface or you don't have some odor coming from uh, interactive system in also your experience. And you definitely don't taste things to understand if you have a kind of feedback or another kind of feedback. So they traditionally do not play a role in HCI. They are scarcely used also nowadays, especially, especially taste. Uh, however, smell is quite interesting as a sense because we have around 12 million olfactory receptor cells in our nose that is able these cells are able to that we are able to detect around 10,000 different odors that is pretty much actually so we we can in our let's say life identify 10,000 different odors that we uh, smell in an environment. Hmm. Similarly for taste, we have 10,000 taste buds on our tongue and in the mouth in general. And each of these taste buds has about 10, 50 cells that are responsible for starting the action of taste. So understanding that we are testing something, something I recognize uh, in the process uh, what we are testing. And these cells are also uh, changing every seven to 10 days. So it's not something that is st stick there, there, but it's something that is renewed every, let's say, week or 10 days. However, differently from a uh, receptor cell that allow us to recognize this 10,000 million odor, uh, we are able to recognize a little bit less than 10,000 different tastes and uh, the taste buds here, these 10,000 taste buds start to decrease, start, we start to lose this taste bud around 50, 60 years old naturally. So we, we can, we could in theory use taste for discriminate some kind of notification we can imagine to, to taste something to, to know if it's good or bad, but just, for, just speaking about uh, random things. And, but we know that uh, as we grow up, we start to lose these taste buds. So uh, an elderly, peop elderly people are able to taste, to recognize taste of less thing than uh, a young person. While this doesn't apply to uh, smell. Uh, but in our, let's say, environment, both smell and taste 
uh, provide us typically with early warning systems when it comes to object or situation that could be problematic for us. And maybe you, you don't realize immediately, but think about uh, food. Think about food that is burning in the kitchen and you smell the fact that the food is burning well before seeing that. And if you smell that specific uh, odor, you can react immediately. And for instance, uh, turning off the, the, the fire under the, the food that is burning or removing the food from the, the oven or something like that. And also about taste, it happens that you have some food and you don't know if it's still good or not. And you taste a little bit of, of this and you know from how it tastes that is Yes, I can try to eat it or no, it's totally gone and I cannot eat it because it's expired and it's really, really bad. So these, these are for, for us early warning system, uh, taste related typically to food, we taste things or, or things that we can eat in some way. And while smell is not only for foods, but it's also for the environment, we, if we smell uh, the, the gas, uh, odor, we know that there is something, the odor that is inserted in the gas in the kitchen, we, we know that there is something that is wrong, that is not working well, and so we can react immediately, uh, well before uh, having other visual or uh, visual signal or seeing fire or so on so on. So again, these are traditionally not playing a role in interactive system and user interface, even if for smell, we see uh, something that is starting to, to have. Uh, and this example that I'm showing you now about smell and taste, uh, because also for taste, there is uh, a nice thing, uh, are more uh, in research, in human computer interaction research, but especially this one on, on smell could be easily uh, moved in a, in a real product. Uh, so for instance, for, for smell, there is this, in car olfactory interaction. Uh, it was a 2017 uh, project uh, published in a conference about automotive user interface. And the idea was to understand uh, if people while driving a car in this way, uh, in this case, a simulated car can uh, derive important information from odors. So basically the idea is uh, while you, the, the idea of this paper was while you are driving, uh, the system here was delivering different sense, different odor to the driver to indicate either a danger on the street or there is a people that is crossing the street or there is some problem on, on, on the pathway uh, and so on, or some point of interest. So look, there is a very nice uh, statue on your right or something like that. So they, they, they wanted to understand and, and they tried this with this prototype in a, a not in a real car uh, going around, but they wanted to, to, to understand if these different scents can convey the information and if the user uh, the driver in this case, while driving, so the main goal was driving, not looking around, uh, while driving could uh, benefit from these different sense in, in the car, uh, again, to either react and having one of these early warning system also in the car in a artificial environment, in artificial task like driving a car, and also to recognize point of interest. So for instance, you can have maybe uh, the, the smoke, uh, odor for danger things and uh, more uh, gracious perfume for point of interest, just to uh, understand things. And, and this quite worked well. Um, and so most of the driver was able with different level to uh, use this odor smell for identifying danger and point of interest around them while they were driving in this obviously artificial uh, environment because this is obviously not a real car and so things could be a little bit different 
uh, in this environment on the rail car. But this is an example or a way of a way to use, in this case, in a closed ecosystem, um, in a closed ecosystem to uh, incentivize some danger. And I, we have two questions. Hope is in the smell of the smoke coming out of the engine. Yeah, actually, Hope is in the smell of the smoke. Uh, they, they set up, I, I don't exactly remember because it, it was 2017, uh, but they choose the smell, different kind of scent uh, for providing information. So my the idea of the smoke was just uh, an example here, uh, just to say. And, it's quite a low alert for something so time sensitive. Well, uh, it's not really, it's not really slow. Uh, well, first of all, it depends on the type of danger that you want to uh, identify. Uh, obviously, if it's something that needs to, to be done immediately, uh, it could be done also in other way. Uh, but don't forget about the redundancy, especially while driving, uh, you can have uh, you have focus on something and you don't see um, you don't see something happening on the screen. So uh, smelling a scent could be that that is not present before could be an indication that something is going uh, is going is going bad is, is happening. Uh, even if you don't have time, if even you don't need to decode the smell to, to understand if it's a dangerous smell or a point of interest smell or uh, maybe you, you maybe just have one smell, one one scent for uh, danger dangerous thing and one scent for mm, not dangerous thing. So you have actually just two things to to the code. So it's not uh, eleven different uh, quality of, of scents, uh, very similar one to each other. And then the car is also a closed environment, and not not a, not not a, not big. So the the scent is is easy to is easier to, to fill the car or the driver with, with the smell. I, in this case, I, I suppose that this is the object that produces the smell so directly into the face of the of the person. So and this quite a, quite a work went well. And there are cars nowadays that have some uh, scent inside the, the cookpit as an optional the high hand car. They do, are not using these for this reason that they are most using for creating a Christmas scent in the car or a holiday scent in the car, just more for a leisure activity. But uh, you can also use eventually this, this opportunity, the scent for maybe indicating uh, a few main point in uh, of things that happens. And this is a, this is a research, so it's not, a product different from the tracker. And this is also a, a nice research uh, because um, the principal investigator of this research that has this website, it is multisensory.info, uh, won a, a ERC grant uh, that is an European research grant for working on multisensory interaction. So basically the ERC is a grant that the, the European Union gives to some researcher who apply not, not a lot of people, it's quite sele it's selective as a grant and give them uh, something like two or three million of euro for working on a project in the next three, five years. And so this, this person here, this, this uh, women here, Mariana Hobrist, uh, applied to this grant a few, a few years ago, applying for exploring multisensory interaction and as part of this bigger search grant selective research, prestigious research grant, he worked on many things, including this. So this is also a uh, well done research, uh, an important research, at least according to a research topic, uh, at least according to uh, the European Union uh, Research Board uh, about uh, HCI in Europe. And, and, and this person, these people here uh, work in the United Kingdom right now. And from the same group, since they are working on multisensory uh, interaction, they also create this test floor about taste because they are exploring different uh, sensory channel for increasing interaction. So while in the first case uh, in 2017, it was something that could work in a car, this is a little bit earlier also because taste is less, is, is more difficult to use 
than the smell for interaction. And they created these test floats, that is this machine here, uh, basically in which uh, it uh, levitate some food morsel. This thing here is a food that is levitating here. And I, I don't remember if, it, if it's also produced by this same machine, this portion of food, or you just need to put here. Uh, but on the website, you, you can have uh, more details, also probably a video uh, and so on, if you're interested. And this is uh, a food morsel. And it's, it's an interactive system that uses levitation, acoustic levitation in this case, to deliver a morsel to the user tongue. So people can actually uh, heat these while levitating. And this is a, a straight, a different taste. This tastes a little bit different than the same morsel uh, put in, in the mount, uh, in say not levitating uh, setting. And again, this is not something that you can apply to a mobile application, but it's an interactive system in some way in which you have the generation of these, in which you have the user that whose main task is probably heating these. It's an early prototype, obviously, uh, of something that can proceed and go uh, um, go further in the next year. Uh, so different from smell, this is much more, let's say, uh, prototype, prototypical and uh, behind, let's say, uh, the, the usage. But it's also nice and it's part of the same group of uh, test of multisensory uh, interaction. And, and this obviously too close the smell and the taste because we don't have actually a lot of other, there are similar ideas, especially in research, but we don't have a lot of other examples, different examples about how to use smell, but smell and, and taste, but smell in particular could be used for providing these uh, early warning system, not only from the environment like we naturally do, but also from interactive system as well. This brings to us to touch and gesture. So let's let's remember that touch uh, is not touching a touch screen, uh, a touch screen, but is more related to optic perception. So our skin that reacts to to things, and. From our perspective, optic perception uh, is a, a main of feedback and provide us in the real world information about the environment. As we told, I told you before, we have information on shape of things. By touching things, we can, even if we close our eyes and we uh, remove, let's say, temporary the um, visual uh, part of the information, uh, we can identify with optic perception the shape of an object, the, the texture, if it's the, the resistance, if it's hard or not, it's soft, the temperature, it's cold, it's hot, and we can compare things. So this probably is smaller than another object of the same uh, size, of the same form. And we can just know this information by touching them with our hands, for instance. And this is more a sense, uh, the uh, movement, the gestures are instead the hands and body movement that are used for providing input to, to computer. So think about the Kinect that somebody was mentioning before, but also think about the smartphone. We are using gestures, we're using hands and finger uh, to swipe, to click, to select, uh, to, to act, to interact with our, with, with these devices. So while uh, gesture as a wide usage, you can for sure think about a different uh, moment in which you use some kind of gesture, hands, fingers, body movement, uh, and so on for interacting with a system for touch and optic perception, uh, there is a little bit less uh, of options and uh, one thing that is not research, that is uh, something uh, uh, real and usable now uh, that pertain to the assistive uh, support tool that we mentioned yesterday is this braille display. So basically this is, this is called the display because it display here text or information in braille. So people who are blind or people who know 
to read blade, uh, braille can through haptic perception hmm? to read the translation in braille on what is written on the screen. So in this page, these things here will provide the braille translation of haptic interaction example, and then bright display, they allow people, blah, blah, blah. Hmm? All these in this display. So you can read by touching this thing and understanding by the dots on the on the display uh, that are something something will be more up, something will be down, and different uh, distances. You can understand the code, you can understand the language and read. And these are hardware uh, devices, and they exist in various format. The most used are the thirty-two charter and 40 charter. So here you have 32 charter, or let's say 32 letters uh, and or 40 charters. And all the display needs again a software for reading the screen and translating what is written on a screen on this other display. And the software is again the screen reader that we mentioned uh, last week that is not only for providing a vocal representation of what is written on screen, but also to provide a brave representation of what is written on a screen. And this is a classical example of optic interaction, uh, specific for reading text in uh, Braille. Uh, another example that again stem from research is for instance, uh, this Tesla Touch. This Tesla Touch is a little bit uh, older than the other two papers, the other two products of research that we I mentioned before, because this is of 2010, so 10 years ago. And this was a prototype by Disney Research, so the same Disney that does the movies, and Disneyland and Disney World also has a, a group of, for, for research in virtual reality, graphics, multimedia, and inter human computer interaction, among the other things. Um, and they created this Tesla Touch. So basically Tesla Touch is uh, a way of simulating patterns of object on a touch screen. So take a touch screen like your smartphone, your tablet, this is bigger, this is a table, but it's the same, it's a, a, a touch screen here. So it's a screen uh, and with electro vibration, on the top of the screen, they were able, variating this electro vibration on this touch, touch surface, they were able to express the feeling, the optic feeling of touching the different materials. So if you touch here, you see all these line, like you, you as metallic line, as you, you will, will do in, in the, the real world if you touch something like this. If you touch here, you will see something like uh, snow, something like uh, so small and with ground and so on. And here, for sand. So the idea is that you touch this thing and you understand via optic the, the material, let's say, that these are simulating. And so you can create software, soft uh, surfaces or hard surfaces, and you can. Uh, create pictures in, in elevation on, that seems on, in elevation on, on, the, on the touch screen or not. And, and this was a product of our research. And I think from the United States, uh, from people in the United States, and I think that this is also in some product somewhere now, uh, maybe not mainstream, but is something that we, maybe we can, we will see more often in also commercial product. And so we maybe one day we can also use this for creating the user interface that react, that behave differently on touch screen according to where you are touching. And here they put six different uh, material, let's say that uh, by touching them, you feel something different in each of the six and they resemble the real material. They are not 100% identical, but they resemble the uh, real material that you may touch in the, let's say in the real world. And this is for optics. Mm -hmm. uh, another 
the, the other that is the sense the, the other part of the of the coin for haptic is gesture and we already mentioned the kinect and we already mentioned um the, the touch screen the normal touch screen but you can also have gesture recognition uh, these these are similar to the kinect so camera based you have a camera and the camera recognized through uh, image processing technique, uh, the, the hands, the body. And here we have two examples. Uh, one is the uh, in-car gesture control for which you can, and there is also a video, uh, for which you can control the infotainment system of a car, of a high-hand car, by ju just waving your hand in front of the screen. So here there is the camera that uh, basically uh, uh, see your shoulder and your hand, so this area in front of the camera, and by waving the hand, by doing some gesture in front of the screen, you can uh, control the audio, the, the, the music, the temperature, the, the calling, and so on. And this here instead is the lip motion, that is this device here that is used mostly uh, for virtual reality nowadays, and it will allow you to track via camera uh, uh, your hands. So, in a, especially in a, so in this case, you see that the person is putting the hand this way, and in the in the 3D uh, space here, the hand, the simulated hand, is identical to this one. So, it's able to track and to track the hands and all the movement and to recreate these. In, in software. So this could uh, enable not only gesture like a Kinect that is full body gesture, ample gesture, but also smaller gesture like just a couple of fingers. And just an example, I would like to show you this uh, in-car gesture control. Here, it's just one minute and we uh, are not going to, to see all, all this video. Uh, so basically, um, so you see there is the car and now it also shows us how it works. So you have this, uh, this screen here and the, the user that is mapped via camera in front of this can do, you see these gestures to select things, to uh, react with things and to control. So to accept or reject the, the call and so on, all by using gesture. So swipe and so different gesture from the hand or the finger, increase the volume, decrease the volume, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so a couple of questions. Do you think that this interface in, in the car is, it could probably be multimodal or not? Yes, and, and which are the other, um, the other modality that are involved. Maybe with voice, but yeah, it could be used by touch. So yes, it's it's probably multimodal. It could be used by touch probably because this probably is a touch screen. Maybe also with voice, we don't know, but it, it's reasonable uh, via gesture. And so the same things can be controlled, let's say with two different modalities. The same thing, so redundancy, gesture and touch. And also, um, so hopefully these, uh, I'm reading comments, so obviously, hopefully, this is this cannot be used when driving. I, I really hope so. I, I don't know, I don't have a, a car like this, so I, I cannot really experiment. And here is shown with a car that is stopped. But I really hope that this, this entire system cannot be used while driving. So while you drive, you start, start doing gestures around. I think that it will be absolutely not safe at all. So hopefully not. But probably uh, gesture, uh, touch, and there is at least one other, surely there is one other way to control this application. And uh, it's basically it's what it's written here. Yeah, you also have 
physical knobs and buttons. So this is a car. So you have all the control that you have in the car. So you have the physical button to do things, to increase the volume, to decrease the volume, etc. You can also do this by probably voice. You can also do this by gestures. You can also do this by touch screen, but this is probably a lot multimodal because you have knobs and buttons, physical knobs and buttons, and you have gesture, then you have voice, maybe, and then you have a touch screen. So it, it has a really a, a full set of different way of controlling this um, in different modalities for, for, for providing input at least, um, for, for doing the same thing. So this is a lot of redundancy for, for, for increasing the bandwidth of interaction. Then I, I think that the message, the last, last message on the chat uh, could be also summarizing, maybe this is, these are not really useful or uh, used at all uh, because you can do this via physical knobs and button, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's probably something nice that the, the car producer added uh, maybe is, there is not a need behind, but they added the technology. And this is something that you can do. Maybe you shouldn't, or maybe it's reasonable in, in same use case, but it's something that technology allow us to do. This is different. This is something that we can do. Maybe we shouldn't, but we can do it this. So this is a specific case in the car, but, um, this same gesture modality can be used also in other contents where maybe there is a more specific need or maybe this could be more useful or not than the car. It's just, you know, an example of something that exists. So if you are on high-hand car, you could probably find this kind of system in, in such a car. And um, I have seen the other message in the chat, but uh, I'm going to, to discuss in the next slides, because these are uh, gesture camera based. And then there are other examples of gesture that are not camera based, like uh, as reported in the chat, the, the, the radar sensor in the Pixel 4. So the, 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 in the Pixel 4 is called the motion sense, um, but it started a few years ago as a research project and still is a research project in part uh, that was called Project Soli that is still here. You still have a website here. And Soli is a, um, a radar, a miniature radar, like one centimeter large uh, that was uh, created not for smartphone like in the Pixel 4, but for smartwatches. So way smaller than smartphone to understand not only human motion, at various scale, but also understand uh, things that may happen in uh, um, uh, just not for understanding human motion, like in the Pixel 4, but also for understanding uh, objects, uh, recognizing objects in the environment. So Soli is, is quite is much more powerful than the Pixel 4, uh, than the device, than the possibility that the Pixel 4 enabled it. And here there is a video, not about the Pixel 4, about Soli, uh, and you can look at it uh, because uh, it, it could be really interesting uh, and, and show you the potentiality of the technology. Again, then it was embedded in the Pixel 4 for doing some things that could uh, for surely it didn't get the popularity in the usage, uh, but as technology could be interesting to explore for recognizing gesture, maybe not in that specific general purpose way, but in other contexts. And here there is a, a group of developer research in this video that uh, actually show what they build with Soli that included also recognizing object. So recognize that something is ceramic or metal or it's a pot or something different. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a radar, essentially. And, and Soli and the motion sense in Pixel 4 essentially work in this way. They uh, obtain the raw signal, then transform the signal, perform some classification in the machine learning sense, and recognize that 
that object, the detected, um, the detected gesture and act consequently. So they choose to implement this in the Pixel 4 down. It, it didn't become popular for whatever reason you, you, you prefer, uh, it's, it's fine, uh, I, I, whatever it is, uh, because its implementation was bad, because developer didn't have access to the technology, because the, the function that they applied was where maybe not particularly useful. I, I don't know, could be everything. It's absolutely agree with everything that you may say, but again, the point is not uh, uh, particularly to, to, to speak about the Pixel 4 and the technology that they choose to adopt here. But again, it's a possibility to recognize gesture, not only with cameras, with all, with all the features, that, the characteristic that camera has, has, but also with other methodologies like radar that doesn't use uh, cameras for performing the same operation. So they, for instance, they done software of the, light, the, the brightness and the environment ca cameras does. So these are way of introducing gesture of different kind. Kinect is another way that is camera based uh, for introducing gesture in a multimodal application. So now Soli is not open for uh, basically nobody, but if you have the Pixel 4 phone this year, they uh, added a, a piece of software that will allow you to use the sensor for, of, of the phone to create a web application. So give you some API to interact with this sensor. Google give you this API. And this is something that happens this year or at the end of last year. And now also in Italy, you can download and use this if you have a Pixel 4, obviously. If you don't have a Pixel 4, no way to use this motion sense and the project solely if you are not one of the developer or the researcher that were involved or are involved in this project by Google. Google research. Next in the list is hearing. Hearing is particularly interesting as we can imagine because obviously sound can provide us with a remarkable amount of information about the environment. So if you, whenever you are try to close your eyes, maybe um, remove your uh, headphone if you have, and, and try to close your eyes and listen what happens around you. Uh, you will see a lot of different sounds, a lot of different noises that came from the environment and you can maybe uh, derive a lot of information about your environment just for just doing this, small say, listening as exercise. Because the hear, our ears can differentiate various sub sound changes, uh, also in a quite subtle way. So also minimal sound changes, it's able to differentiate that and can recognize familiar sounds when we are doing other things and, and without concentrating attention on the specific sound source. So if you think, if you are focused on, on reading, on doing something, on so using your vision uh, and somebody else, maybe in your home is calling by your name, uh, you will recognize your name. And so you answer, even if you are 100% focused on another activity, because you recognize or you decide not to answer, but at least you recognize the sound that is coming from another room or from a person that is behind you. Uh, even if you don't look at, at this person because you are focused on something else. So this is something that the hear and our hearing system is uh, able to detect or recognize automatically this capability of quite to differentiate quite subtle sound changes and also recognize familiar sounds and familiar voices uh, in, in a sense. Uh, however, hearing and all these capability are really used in design, in, in user interface design. As we experience, it is mostly confined to notification, warning, typing sound, like when you type on a keyboard, on a touch screen, uh, and, and, some, and something like this. So to notify, to warn, uh, to give a feedback, a small feedback about uh, an operation that you are doing with other, with your hands or about things that happens visually. Obviously multimedia, video games, videos, etc., are all an exception of these, where their virtual reality in part 
is an exception of this uh, because obviously their sound and hearing are more involved in, in the process. But let's say graphical user interface in a smartphone and computer don't rely a lot on hearing. Even if, again, for us as human, hearing has a, a good presence in, in our life for understanding as a sense. And hearing can be uh, split in non-vocal sound and voice and speech. Um, and let, let's start from non-vocal sound. Uh, non-vocal sound I often use to provide transitory information like warnings, events, you get a new mail, you get a message and so on. They must be learned. The, the various pointing, squeak, whatever. They must be learned. It's not a big learning, but it's something that we, we should learn that this thing is the message on WhatsApp. It's not the message on, it's not a new mail. To, 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 to distinguish uh, that that sound is specific to some, an event that happened. Uh, but on the other side, they are, they are language independent. So once you recognize that Boeing is for some uh, specific action that happened, uh, you can speak in English, you can speak in Italian, you can be native in, in any country with any language and you recognize that, that Boeing is something that is related to this specific because it's something that you learn to recognize. And these non-vocal sound are also demonstrated to be useful because in the here, uh, the human computer interaction community performed a lot of experiment and demonstrated uh, a series of things like the video games without sounds are harder with the same with respect to the same video game with sound. So if you play a video game without sound, or you play the same video game with sound, it's easier to complete the mission, to go or to, to proceed in the video game when you have so sound on. Uh, if you enable key clicks on your smartphone, uh, uh, in a keyboard, in a, the virtual keyboard. If you have a key clicks, you commit less typing errors than without sound. Because this feedback probably on long time give you uh, some information about that you are typing the, the letter, you're typing in a space or you're typing things wrongly. And also, uh, if you are an immersive virtual environment, also on a screen, uh, auditory cues, so sound that were emitted in specific portion of the screen or specific portion environment, it can help navigate the user in the environment, for instance. So if you are in a virtual environment, having some sound that comes from one area, one, one portion of, of one side, let's say, or another side, help you navigating and orienting inside the space much more than the same space visually without sound. This is because how our hearing system is quite, as, as I said before, is quite poor, powerful and flexible and is able to, and we, we use a lot of our hearing implicitly in our life. So adding this uh, sound, the non-vocal sound actually help us in performing our task better from something simpler like click, key clicks when we're using a virtual keyboard. So something a little bit more complex like navigating in a virtual environment, an immersive virtual environment. And non-vocal sound traditionally split in computer system at least split in two categories. We have uh, auditory icons and another one that I, I will tell you in a moment. And auditory icons, uh, were born in the 80 uh, for the Apple's Finder in particular, and then were, uh, let's say, adopted to ev from every other operating system in the subsequent years. So for, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, macOS, the Apple's Finder is the equivalent of Windows Explorer, Windows Nautilus on some Linux distribution and so on. So auditory icons are caricatures of naturally analog, let's say, occurring sound. And the idea was uh, we have icons that depict something on screen and auditory icons use instead natural or let's say word in, sounds in the word to represent 
different types of object of action. Like icons indicate different type of object or action on screen, auditory icons use natural sound to represent different uh, type of action, uh, not by seeing them, but by hearing them. Uh, in this case, since they use natural sound, auditory icons, natural sound, these natural sounds have some semantic associated in the world, in the outside world, which can be then mapped to the meaning uh, that this action has in the, uh, in, the in, in the computer system, in the user interface. And, and the problem here is that obviously not everything has a sound with a specific meaning in it, but something as, and we, we, we experiment, if you think, a lot of these moment in our user interface. In addition to using the natural sound, you can also use additional information to provide more, more, more detail in, in a way on the interaction. You can use, for instance, stereo audio for positional information. So on the left, because something is happening on the left, on the right, because something is happening on the right and vice versa, or muffled sound. So if, if, if something that happens uh, not, in for, not in the ground, so you have an action on a background application that is happening, and you can have the same sound that you will have in the foreground, but muffled, because the object is behind other things uh, it's obscured in, in a certain way. It's not forefront. It's not in first, uh, in first place like other. You are working on application. The application behind this could emit a sound that is muffled with respect to the sound that will uh, emit normally because it's behind another application. It's not in focus. And let's, and for let's, I, I mean you, uh, Let's provide two examples of auditory icons that came to your mind. The trash, yeah, the trash is an example of auditory icon. When you empty the trash, that sound of paper or glasses or whatever it is, it's a sound that came from the uh, natural world. And so it's an auditory icon to represent the success of this operation. Another one. What is the ring? Mm. So, and the bell sound, yeah, you, you can have, I don't probably when the, the phone ring or something like that, you can have a sound of a phone ringing, uh, for instance. Uh, that is because in the analog world, the phone added that sound and you have uh, that uh, sound. Bell sound for notification. Yes, it could, it could, it, bell sound is obviously a, a let's say natural uh, sound. And then the meaning for associating the bell with the notification is a, a, a meaning that is learned like in the trash, but this, this is one. A another, it's it's easier. There is another, at least another one. What happens when you uh, take a photo on some smartphones? Do you have a sound or not? The shutter click. So this is exactly when you take a, 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 a photo with your smartphone. You have the shutter click. Obviously, you don't have that sound. The smartphone is not doing the sound for, for real. It's just an auditory icon that resembles the sound that a photo, that's a, that's a camera does when it's analog, analog, let's say camera does when uh, you pick a photo, you take a photo. So all these are auditory icons because they're icon that use natural, let's say uh, sound in the world to uh, deliver, um, Yes, also the sound of the wind when you successfully send an email. The locking and locking sound is not really, it depends, not always natural. It depends on the kind of sound. Uh, because if it's the sound of a, 
of something that is locked in the real world, yes, if it's an artificial sound, it's not uh, like the iPhone has not a natural sound for locking the screen. So it depends. Uh, because it's, it should be a natural sound, some, a sound that deals, uh, it is happening in, in, in some way in the natural world, in the world, in the real world. Uh, instead, if the sound is not natural, but is synthesized, is structured, is ping, is boing, is something like that, or is a music, a short music, uh, we are not speaking about auditory icons, we are speaking about hear cons. Uh, hear cons uh, as a term was coined more or less in the same year as auditory icons in 1985. Uh, in this case, we don't have one single creator like in the, in the previous case, because in that year, more or less in the same period, uh, we had two papers that use this term. So who is the, the owner, the creator of this term is not, is, 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 is unclear. But essentially, an hearcon uh, born as a pun to the high con, because high con, the high of high con sounds like the high. So high con is something that you see, and the hear con is something that you hear. So they replace the first letter with hear, and it becomes hearcons. Since they are synthesized structure sound, not like the, the shutter click on the camera uh, on the smartphone, they don't have a direct relationship with the event or the information. And they are not natural sign. So their meanings need to be learned. Well, you know that the shutter on a smartphone does that sound because the camera does that sound, uh, a real camera, not an analog camera, let's say, does the sound. Uh, here you have to learn the sound and because the structure is synthesized like the locking and locking sound for some smartphone. You click and you see you, see, you heard a sound that is not the sound in the real world, but it's an artificial sound, it's structured. Uh, and also could be also longer than this. And here cons are composed of motives. They are typically short, rhythmic, sequence of pitches of different intensity, quality, dynamics, and they are used to add context in what happens mostly. Mm. Similar to auditory icons in this, but the main difference is that they are synthesized and structured sound. So probably for some, when you dial up a number, it's ear con. It depends what you hear when you dial up a number. It could or could not. Uh, it depends on specific sound because it, could, it can be different from phone to phone, for instance. Um, but for instance, the locking and locking, it could be uh, a sound, uh, the um, hear cone, and the notification that came from WhatsApp, the ping, uh, whatever it is, could be an ear cone. The music that you put for your, um, in your smartphone where somebody uh, call you, uh, it's a, uh, um, an ear, uh, it's an ear cone, the xylophone, it's the sound that a xylophone as an instrument does, it's probably an ear cone uh, because it's, it's not a natural sound, it's a composed sound that it's music in a sense. It's not the sound of the wind, or the sound of the shutter. It's not a sound that naturally happen in a, an analog device in the real world. It's, it's, a, it's built, it's structured as a sound. And these are the two main things of uh, sound structured and hear cones structured and auditory icons that are instead natural, coming from the real world. And this is for hearing, for what concerns hearing and sound. Obviously, we also can use hearing for voice and speech. And the first question that I have is, which is the difference from between voice and speech for you, according to you? Do you have a difference and um, what is? Voice is natural and speech is, is not natural. Speech as a conventional sense, yes. 
uh, speech as a conventional sense also vo also voice could could have a conventional sense. Obviously, speech as a more structured conventional sense. Uh, the, the last message is 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 the more the most precise. So, voice is any sound produced by us. So, mm hmm is still using voice or ha is still using voice. It's not speech. I'm emitting sound with my mouth and with my voice, but it's, it's not uh, speech. Speech instead is structured and speech is most importantly language dependent. My speech in Italian is different than my speech in English because it's language dependent. So it's more structured. So voice is just the, the medium, let's say, the fact that we can produce some noises and we use this uh, as noise. Speech is how we structure that voice to uh, convey some information in uh, a language dependent structured way. And, and for what concern computer, we mostly use a speech more than voice. Um, and for a computer for now, fully understanding natural language still remains a dream. So at now, even if we have things like Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, and so on, they are not able to fully understanding natural language as another person. Uh, this application, also simpler application, uh, simulate a natural language interaction, simulate a speech interaction, but with some constraint. For instance, they require the user to speak and to know, and to learn, a restricted set of spoken commands. So you should know what to say to a computer. You cannot just speak as any other person and they, they will understand. Uh, any of these assistant, but also simpler system, uh, have a set of spoken command that they recognize. And if they don't recognize, they have a default answer like I don't know what to do, or I'm looking on, on the internet or something like that. And this set could be more or less small, obviously, for things like Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, obviously the set is large, could be 10,000 of different uh, variation of sentences. For other things could be just three or four. So let's think for a moment uh, as an example in the car. Uh, so for instance, uh, most of the car nowadays, but also 10, 50 years ago, uh, had the possibility to press a button and say, call this number or set the temperature to 21 degree by speaking with the car. That is voice interaction. This is speech interaction with the car. This is not sophisticated like Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, it's just, probably the car should recognize just these three, four uh, options. Call number, call name, uh, set temperature to, increase the volume, decrease the volume. So a, a very limited number is, is, is not really understanding natural language. It's more, it's more matching some sentences that the driver is, is saying with some uh, other sentences that are memorized somewhere. And if, if there is a good match, the action is performed. Uh, things like Siri, Google Assistant, and so on, perform uh, a little bit more, obviously, of language uh, understanding that, than the, the example in the car. But also they have a restricted set of spoken command. You cannot ask everything. Uh, for instance, uh, with, with Alexa, you can ask, uh, tell me what's in TV tonight. And it will start a long list of on right uno, there is this, on the right one, there is this and so on. Uh, but you cannot, if you ask, so the, the impression is that you, uh, the, the Alexa know uh, the program in TV. So I, I can ask, tell me tonight what's on TV. And I have an answer that is consistent and right, but if I, ask, if I ask for, tell me what, what there is on TV now or this afternoon or tomorrow or any other moment that is not tonight, uh, we don't have an answer. So this is, this is something again that we should learn because 
tell me what is on TV today now is not in the set of spoken command that Alexa is able to recognize, interpret, and react to. While the same command with tonight is, is something that uh, the, the vocal assistant is able to understand and process correctly. So, and this is one of the biggest problem uh, that we have with uh, this kind of intelligent agent, um, vocal agent, that we don't have uh, any clue on what we can ask them, and we need, uh, and and we need to learn what to say. And many times we don't even remember; they don't even remember what was said previously. This is another example, or. Uh, the first time that we ask something, we have a results, and the second time that we ask the same things, that we have a, a slightly different results or a totally different results. And this mixed together various things that we will see next week um, when we spoke of a human AI interaction, and we will use this voice assistant uh, as an example, as use case, because they obviously have some uh, Siri, Google Assistant, and Alexa, some AI component in the natural language processing, obviously. Uh, it's not matching of sentences because there are too much. Uh, this set is quite large. Uh, and they also have some peculiarity uh, coming from the fact that they don't rely uh, a lot of, for nothing on screens. So we don't have a visual feedback on what happens. We can just speak and we receive an answer in hearing. So we, we put together this uh, AI um, and uh, um, plus voice interaction that makes things a little bit more complex than other kind of AI uh, things. And, and then there is also so one of these, the issues is learning, another issue that is proper to any AI system, AI-backed system, is that um, AI is, let's say, non-deterministic in the same way as our a traditional graphic user interface. So in a traditional graphic interface, you will have always have a button at the same point, and when you click on the button, the same action will happen. On uh, in uh, any uh, user interface, vocal or not, that uses AI in some way, you don't have this. You maybe today you have a suggestion of a movie, and tomorrow that suggestion disappeared. So you have something in that specific place that you previously don't have. Uh, this typically doesn't happen in a graphic user interface, traditional graphic user interface. And then obviously these things work differently. So Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, Cortana, and just name one of the other, Bixby of Samsung by Samsung, they all work. They have, let's say, a set of things that uh, they work well for a set of things. And then for other things, there are assistants that work better and others that uh, work a little bit worse. Um, and some of them are on computer, smartphone, other are also in standalone device. And we will focus more on these on standalone device because they are also in a different environment with respect to computer and the smartphone. Uh, so obviously there is not everything that is voice-based or speech-based is related to this kind of complexity like Alexa and so on. But you can also have simple thing uh, like the thing in the car. And from a computer perspective, you have two main components when you're speaking about voice-based interaction or speech-based interaction more correctly. You have for sure a first moment that is the speech recognition so taking the speech from the user and transcribing it in text. And in the end, you have a speech synthesis. So taking the text resulting from a series of operation and produce speech back. And these two components can be used together uh, in the same process, like in Alexa or uh, other things, and can also be used separately. Uh, some application, in addition to the speech recognition, speech synthesis part can also leverage other more complex artificial intelligence based procedure like natural language processing or understanding. So you have uh, in, for instance, in Google Assistant, you have speech to text maybe, and then this text is parsed and this process is, an, there is understanding about 
the natural language is contained in this text. And then maybe some action happens. It depends on which kind of what were you asking. If you're asking about the time, maybe if there is the, 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 the connection to a time provider. If you're asking the weather, there is the, the connection to the weather provider and so on. And then there is the textual answer that is converted in speech for the user. So these are the two points at the beginning and the end of the process they can be used together or separately. And here, and then we stop here, we have two examples. So Google Translate is probably the one that you, uh, just simple example, not the complex as a series. Google Translate is probably the most famous web, where Google Translate on, on a web browser, on a computer as a speech recognition or synthesis. Do you know? It has text to speech indeed. So uh, for instance, if you write something here uh, in Italian, let's say, and it translates in English and there is this button here that basically it show how to say a word of a sentence. So this is, speech synthesis, text to speech. And the other system that is mentioned in the slide that is this one dictation uh, is a simple system which you can actually um, speak and it's just text to speech. You see, actually it's just text to speech again. Um, and then you can press stop and obviously it stops to, uh, to write this, this thing. And also these, in addition to just performing text-to-speech as a series of commands, like for instance, if I want to insert a new paragraph, I should say new paragraph. So in the recording mode, if I say new paragraph, uh, the, the system should not write new paragraph on screen, like did for actually just text-to-speech, uh, but uh, it should create a new paragraph. So interpret that not as something that should be translated, and written on screen, but process it and some action should apply. So again, the first step in any case is text is speech to text. Then here there is a bit of analysis of which text is pronounced. If it's one of these command, then the action that is related should uh, should should work, should 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 happen. And if it's not one of these command, then it's translated, it is written here. And then obviously this. For instance, it's set up with English, United States, but you can change the language and is influenced by uh, the microphone, the quality of the microphone last year, when we tried this in the classroom with the microphone of the classroom, it worked very, very badly. Uh, probably because the, the room was bigger, the microphone was uh, of low quality or more distant, or there was speakers in the room. So it, it depends on, on a lot of factor. It depends on the accent of the person that is speaking. Now is trying to, understand English as spoken in the United States, uh, but you also have English in Brit British English, you have Australian English uh, and so on. So there are a lot of factors that came into play in this speech to text and text to speech and in the vo vocal part uh, of the interaction. Okay, so we can stop here and we will complete this slide that are just two or three next week when we also start speaking about human AI interaction. Uh, if you have any question, please write them in the chat. Otherwise we will see tomorrow for uh, the heuristic evaluation lab.